Uh, hey guys, so this video is going to be on the liver and how the liver can cause pain in the right upper quadrant and we're going to cover some of the main pathology associated with that. Uh, this is supposed to be just a summary, just a quick review on liver diseases just in case you have a, someone with right upper quadrant pain and the liver is there on your differential. So up here on the top left I've listed some of the liver labs that are commonly ordered. We have AST, ALT, these are the enzymes that leak from damaged liver cells into the blood. Then we have ALKFOS and GGT, these are more biliary specific, but they also indicate liver damage. Then we have uh, impaired liver function. So here we have liver damage and liver function, which really we're detecting with bilirubin. Liver creates bile from bilirubin. So uh, if the bilirubin is going up, that means liver is not functioning like it should be. Liver also makes albumin, right? So if the serum albumin is down, that indicates that liver is not doing its job. And prothrombin time. So liver makes our clotting factors. Mainly we have factor seven, right? If uh, bile isn't being produced properly, we don't have our fat soluble vitamins like vitamin K being absorbed, then we don't have vitamin K helping in the production of factor seven, prothrombin time is gonna go up. And lastly, we have thrombocytosis, which is just an indicator for inflammation that can tell you that the liver might be damaged. So that's an increased platelet count. Um, next here, let's talk about alcoholic hepatitis. The classic ratio here is AST ALT greater than one, and you're going to see this just mainly for alcoholic sources of liver disease. In non-alcoholic sources, ALT is going to be greater than AST, or they're going to be roughly one, so you're going to see less than one in those cases. So ethanol is metabolized to ACTH, as we all know, then ACTH goes on to increase NADH, so our NADH NAD ratio is going to go up. That causes increased triglycerides. And this fat eventually builds up, causing steatohepatitis in the liver. So fat is really not that great when it builds up in the liver because it can cause inflammation, poor circulation, and ultimately lead to liver damage and cirrhosis. So what are some markers for alcoholic hepatitis? We have increased serum ferritin. Uh, liver is one of the main stores of iron, so when it's damaged, ferritin can go up. Then we have macrocytic anemia. This is more related to the dietary deficiencies associated with alcohol. So B12 and folate are some of the vitamins that alcoholics commonly miss out on. So we're going to have microcytic anemia related with that. And a common, very specific marker for alcoholic liver damage is CDT, carbohydrate deficient transferrin. And this is a test that's very specific for alcoholic liver disease. Next, let's talk about non-alcoholic liver disease. So NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. This is associated with obese patients, type 2 diabetics, those with metabolic syndrome. So these are your fat patients. And the it's also associated with medications. So we have amiodarone, glucocorticoids, estrogen, and antiretroviral drugs that can cause NASH-like uh, disease. Let's cover some drugs and toxins too while we're down here. So acetaminophen toxicity, that's your Tylenol overdose patient, a lot of suicide cases uh, in, in this acetaminophen toxicity uh, category. Then we have phenytoin, halothane, and isoniazid. So we have our TB drug. Our halothanes are inhaled anesthetic, not really used anymore, and phenytoin, which is used for seizure control. And then we have uh, an Amanita pyloides, and that's our death cap mushroom. So keep that on the differential if your patient's an avid hiker, likes to pick their own mushrooms, uh, can cause liver damage. So that has a kind of a, a toxic period, then a little bit of a window period, and finally they go into a full hepatic failure. So. After that, we have aflatoxin from our aspergillus fumicoides, so fungal toxin again. And then we have alcohol and cocaine, which we've already talked about. So alcohol can damage the liver through its reactive oxygen species and its buildup of fatty tissue. And then cocaine is really a vascular uh, drug where it can compromise the vasculature of the liver. We have viral hepatitis, which we're, we're going to discuss in just a second later on. Then we have vascular disorders, so Bud Chiardi syndrome, where you have obstruction of the hepatic vein and without proper circulation, liver tissue is going to be damaged from hypoxia and ischemic hepatitis from there. In pregnancy, we have HELP syndrome, so hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. That's what that stands for, classically associated with pregnancy and hypertension. And then we also have acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Other than that, we have our autoimmune disorders, which we're also going to cover in a second, and Wilson's disease, which is our copper accumulation disease and copper is going to build up in the liver because it can't be transported out. I have a video on Wilson's disease, which you can check out on my channel. All right, so let's talk about some of the viral causes of hepatitis. So what happens in a viral disease is the virus is going to infect your cell. I stole this image from osmosis and they have a great explanation. Essentially, the virus infects your cell 
and then it presents on a MHC class 1 uh, receptor, then our CD8 T cell is going to come in and kill that cell. So really, it's not the virus that's causing cell death. It's your immune response to the virus that's causing cell death. Kind of similar to an autoimmune reaction, but in this case, it's viral induced. Okay, so let's cover the uh, hepatitis viruses. So we're going to go through A, B, D, and E, and C. All right, and it's kind of a little bit out of order, not A, B, C, D, E, because these are related in certain ways. So A and E are um, really are light hepatitis viruses. They're going to self-resolve. They're usually fecal orally transmitted. Let's cover A first. So we have a A, which comes in a prodromal disease of one to two weeks, fever, malaise. You're going to get kind of cold symptoms. Anorexia, nausea, and vomiting are associated with this. Um, and then we have right upper quadrant pain and tender hepatomegaly. So this person is going to present to your clinic. Maybe they just came from a trip, uh, a vacation in the Bahamas or somewhere. They had some street food that wasn't properly cooked. And now they have hepatitis A as a result. Um, we're going to see jaundice in this patient. We're going to see dark uh, urine and pale stools because the liver is affected, bile flow is affected, puritis from the increased bilirubin and the symptoms usually self-resolve. Hepatitis E is very similar, but we have certain things to look out for in this case. Uh, it's associated with fulminant hepatitis in pregnancy, so full liver failure in pregnancy. So watch out for that. There's also no vaccine for hepatitis E, unlike for A, which has its own vaccine. And it's also fecal orally transmitted, similar to A. So in terms of hepatitis B, um, how I like to think about it is transmitted through sex drugs and being born. So here we have our transmission in sexual parenteral. So that means needle stick injuries through healthcare work or through, let's say, you're handling needles on a daily basis, you're a heroin user, contaminated instruments and needles and surgeries, or for example, again, with heroin users sharing needles and then, or any other kind of drug user really. So IV drug users is something to look out for here. And then we also have contaminated blood products if they're not properly checked and we have perinatal, so mom can transmit to baby. Uh, one thing to consider for hepatitis B is you can always have a hepatitis D super infection, and these patients are usually worse off because both viruses kind of work together to destroy the liver. I've included here on the right some, some of the treatment regimens. So we have nucleoside, nucleotide analogs. So these are tenofovir and entecovir, uh, which are used for hepatitis B treatment, and we also have interferon alpha. So when considering these are the main three treatments. Moving on to hepatitis C, our other chronic hepatitis, it has parenteral infection. So this is another bloodborne virus. It has needle sharing with IV drug users, very similar risk factors to B really. Needle stick injury, uh, organ transplant patients can be, infect themselves with the hepatitis C from the donor. Uh, sexual transmission though in C is more rare. So that's one of the main differences between B and C. B is more sexual transmission, C is more blood transmission. Here I've included some of the treatment regimens based on the genotypes. So there's multiple different types of genotypes, one through six of hepatitis C, and I've included the treatment regimens for all the types and based on which genotype can be used. So here they are for your uh, viewing pleasure. Next, let's move on to autoimmune hepatitis. So autoimmune hepatitis, uh, it's really idiopathic. Nobody really knows how it begins or um, what the pathophysiology really entails for the starting of autoimmune hepatitis. But what's noticed is that you'll usually see ANA, so anti-nuclear antibodies, as well as uh, anti-smooth muscle antibodies. And this is a key test question right here, anti-smooth muscle antibodies for autoimmune hepatitis. And ANA is something you see in also things like lupus and things like that. Um, you're also going to see an increase in IgG, so that's classic for this autoimmune type of hepatitis. Uh, things you should look out for when you detect someone with this hepatitis is other autoimmune diseases. So you're going to look for diabetes, Hashimoto's, and celiac. Ask questions specific to the symptomatology of these three other autoimmune diseases. Make sure you connect the dots when you see that. All right, then we have uh, primary biliary cirrhosis and primary sclerosing cholangitis. Um, PBC and PSC are associated with um, inflammation of the colon and inflammation of the gut. So we're going to see them with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. PBC is more associated with women. Uh, you're going to see anti-mitochondrial antibodies, so that's the key diagnostic factor right there. Anti-nuclear antibodies and IgM. So autoimmune is IgG, PBC is IgM, all right? This is an intrahepatic disease, so it's really going to affect the bile ducts inside the liver. And PSC, as we'll see, is intrahepatic and extrahepatic. All right, um, then we have PSC, which is associated mainly with ulcerative colitis, 
and a chronic course of ulcerative colitis can lead to PSC. It has anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, the P type, so these are perinuclear. P anca is associated with PSC. And finally, one thing on the last uh, that you want to consider with a differential of right upper quadrant abdominal pain is something like hepatocellular carcinoma or a liver mass that can be rubbing up onto the peritoneum causing irritation, things like that. Liver masses are usually pretty painless, uh, so it would have probably progressed for a while before it's detected as right upper quadrant pain. Okay, and you'll probably see other things like weight loss and uh, changes in stool habits before you see the right upper quadrant pain in terms of a malignancy going on. All right, so this has been a quick overview on uh, liver disease and things you should consider when looking at right upper quadrant pain. I hope this was helpful and I'll see you in the next video.